Now is the chance to use reliable energy to grow your money with the Dominion Energy Reliability Investment. Our new investment product offers competitive returns, no maintenance fees, and flexible online access to your money. Make the reliable investment in reliable energy. The Dominion Energy Reliability Investment. To find out more, go online to reliabilityinvestment.com. That's reliabilityinvestment.com. You probably already like browsing Zillow for fun, but did you know that Zillow actually makes it easy to find a new home? With Zillow, you see the most listings of any real estate site, and they're updated every five minutes, so you don't have to worry about missing out on the one. Plus, take virtual tours from the comfort of your couch, so you know what to expect before you see it in person. And if that didn't simplify the process enough, Zillow also connects you with local agents. So when you're ready for a new home, find it on Zillow.com. Hey everyone, this is the Almost Rogue Podcast. Bringing to you mind-blowing interviews with guests from all over the world. So settle down, relax, and enjoy the show. Oh yeah, by the way, if you like the podcast, please support Elmo's World Podcast on Patreon. Your support is what helps the podcast improve more and more. Welcome to Elmo's World Podcast. This is Elmo Dor Jr., your host. Thank you all for uh, listening. And I have my friend John Connor. He's not the guy from Terminator movies, but um, <laughs> but yeah, so John... Like, how do we defeat Skynet? I'm just kidding. But yeah, John, like, it's nice to meet you, man. Uh, Thank you so much for being on my podcast. And, you know, um, can you introduce yourself a little bit so we could get to know you? Yeah, I go by John Connor on the internet. And uh, um, I I studied pharmacy at university. So I went to school to be a pharmacist. So I studied chemistry, math. I have a degree in pharmacy. Uh, social work as well as um, pharmaceutics is like pharmacy math and uh, I've retired early so I just got into doing philosophy um, learning logic on social media and you know getting into apologetics a little bit philosophy of religion so I have a lot of time on my hands to learn these things so I guess basically that's how I ended up here. I have a a new model of God based on Thomism. It's like a Neoplatonic interpretation based on existential Thomism, which maybe a lot of people are not familiar with. They're more familiar with the Aristotelian Thomism. You know, everything's act potency. They're not really um, well-versed in the the, um, concept of essay or ends or actus ascendi, or God is tantum essay, you know what I mean? So maybe I'll get into a little bit of explaining what that's all about. But I guess, like, before we start, bro, like, I want to ask you what your thoughts on on the academic side of philosophy nowadays, you know? Like, what do you think about the progress that's happening? And, you, you know, you're someone who's retired now and focusing on philosophy. So what do you think on, like, people being, are, um, let's say, not professionals, but, you know, amateurs who are just passionate about philosophy, how do, do we penetrate this, I guess, community? I think it's it's a great time to be interested in that with, with social media and the internet. It, it provides a, a great reach because you can get, you can get a, a well-rounded education just by connecting with people on the internet, you know what I mean? You can watch lectures on at Stanford University on, you know, uh, black hole thermodynamics. You can take a course in, uh, like some people upload a course in quantum mechanics. You know, you can learn quantum mechanics. It's, it's not a, it's not better than, you know, attending lectures and ha- actually having a professor help you out. But you can get a, a basic grasp on many different concepts. So it's a great time to really be alive and to be interested in philosophy. Is that yeah. what you were yeah 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 that's true okay well you know i guess that 
you started out being a pharmacist, right? But why? Yeah, I did that because my family were right sort of now, in that. Uh, the thing is, I wanted to be. I had a little bit of a reversion as a Catholic. I got away from going to to uh, to church. I was sort of like um, a Christmas and Easter Catholic when I was growing up, and I didn't really have too much guidance in it. And uh, I had a little bit of turmoil in my life, in let's say my early 30s or something like that. And um, it led me to get become more spiritual in a way. So I I got into reading. Eastern philosophy and reading, um, you know, um, Jack Kerouac and the Beatnik poets, and they were right into Hindu religion. And you know, I was reading Herman Hesse and Siddhartha and Steppenwolf, and I sort of got into that kind of uh, a spiritual sort of feeling about life. And because I'd had a lot of emptiness in my life, it was just about going after money and trying to be rich. And you know, you want to get get your Mercedes Benz and get your Rolex watches and get all your houses and the hell with everybody, you know, screw the world, just make sure you're okay. You know, that's that was basically my mindset, you know, it's us against them and screw you before, you know, screw the other guy before he gets you. And uh, that didn't lead me very far. It just let, leaves you with an empty feeling, you know what I mean? So, like, if you really don't want to believe in God and be a true atheist, then... I, I, you know, I was getting pretty hardcore there, so I, I'm glad that I, I reached a point where it was almost like mind numb. You know, you'd go gambling and uh, take these big, expensive trips and holidays, but you'd feel empty inside. And uh, so I started getting into reading religious things, and and I remember my uh, grandmother grew. Uh, she brought me up with, uh, you know, she pray the rosary and things like that and we had friends who were into the saints so I started exploring about the saints and eventually I came across uh, we went on this um, a weekend meditation and I came across the Summa by Thomas Aquinas and I guess that kind of changed my life because I really had an intense longing to really learn about spirituality and uh, then I, I wanted to become like I was I was investigating becoming a Carthusian monk because Carthusians are sort of like the the hardcore discipline, the most disciplined monks you can get, you know, where they just stay inside and they just meditate constantly. So I was looking in that into the, in that direction. So that led me into learning. I, I met a couple of Carthusian monks who quit, and um, they said, you know, you should learn this and learn that, and learn that, learn logic, study philosophy learn all the ancients like, you know, Boethius and Avicenna and Thomas Aquinas and uh, Albert the Great and all these other philosophers from the Middle Ages. So I, I got into just reading that and I had, like I said, we made a lot of money and I had a lot of time on my hands so I really didn't have to do much except I had, I could just read and then you have the internet and there uh -huh. you go, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is so mind blowing, but can I ask you, like, you know, you studied Eastern philosophy and also lo a like, little uh, bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But also like analytic philosophy. What, what would you say about like when analytic philosophers look at Eastern or even just continental philosophy and just dismiss them all over? Because like, just because it's not that logical, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, I like, I mean, there is a place for continent, like there's a place for continent style philosophy, sure, for sure. When you're talking about ethics and politics and things like that, you really have to think things through. And so there are a lot of gray areas. It's not, you can't do this, this huge argument with all these premises for a political position because, you know, there's a gray areas there, especially with ethics too, you know what I mean? So... I, I'm I'm not really into ethics and politics and political philosophy and social philosophy or sociology or anything like that. My was more drawn to the analytic, the analytic type of philosophy with the, you know, you have the formal logic and the Frisian yeah, style but, logic, but and you, you have all of the premises, and it's like black the, and white. Yeah, you're also someone who studied the Eastern philosophy, like. Uh, I did, yeah, because I was into poetry when I was in university. I, uh, I, I used to. They had a, like a at our university they had a really good poetry and rare books section. So, 
instead of studying the, the pharmacy, which I was completely bored with, I would just end up in the poetry and rare books and, and be reading poetry. And I actually wrote a book of poetry a long time ago. So I was right into the beatnik poets and Allen Ginsberg and uh, Gregory Corso and Jack Kerouac. I don't know if you know all those guys, but they're sort of the beatnik poets. So I was kind of into that kind of thing. So I ended up writing a lot of uh, poetry, you know, you drink your whiskey, you write your poetry, you have a religious experience, right? <laughs> yeah, that's so, that's so awesome, man. I'm so jealous. <laughs> okay, okay. So anyway, so what are your thoughts on Eastern philosophy right now? Because you some, were someone who studied lo formal, like, formal logic, symbolic logic, you know, analytic philosophy. What do you say about those inconsistent and incoherent, you know, premises that Eastern philosophers make? Oh, well, you mean Eastern philosophy? I think Eastern philosophy actually is, is, is uh, it ties into sort of like quantum mechanics and things like that. It's like everything is like a vibra in a vibrational realm and they're all probabilities and nothing's black and white. So it's... I think I I I can't give you a really good, um, a pro, like almost like a professional opinion because I haven't really read a lot of what the professionals say about it. As a, as but you know I could give you a better opinion on Thomism and things like that. You know what okay. I mean? Okay. Okay. It was like it was a, the the amount that I studied uh, Eastern f philosophy was like just reading. Uh, the sayings of Confucius and Lao Tzu, the the the, the Tao Tzu, the the book by Lao Tzu. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Okay. And uh, some some of the poetry, some of the Vedas mm -hmm. and the Upanishads. But I didn't really like actually study it and get right into it. It was sort of like a stepping stone to Thomism, and as Thomism is the thing that I really loved and I studied a lot and I I really liked it and I got into having a tutor and really learning about Thomism. Okay, but can I ask you, like, why did you study Thomas then? Like, why in why you're so into Thomism? Uh, I started to get into, like I said, I wanted to be a priest. I wanted to go to be looking into becoming a monk. So somebody, one of the monks there told me to get into reading Thomism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what I got into. And then I was really right into the saints, memorizing all the saints, learning the saints' lives. And so I ended up on the Internet one day on uh, was the eCatholic 2000 or something. So I ended up being a host on eCatholic 2000. And uh, so I, I sort of was doing hobbyist apologetics on that uh, site for a few years as Jacob Canada. And... Uh, Geez, I was on there 12 hours a day reading the Summa for five hours a day or something back to front uh, and uh, arguing with Protestants and like, I don't know, and the, it was a Summa contra Gentiles also, so I got a good education there, like a, not a professional education, but it was, a, it was almost the next best thing of reading the Summa four or five hours each day, do you know what I mean? You came into Christianity, but and then dived into philosophy, right? But I guess you started. Yeah, I took out... some philosophy at university too, but I wasn't really interested in it. But once I got into Thomas Aquinas, and then I saw how how rigorous his intellect was, and how what a towering intellect he had, and so I was really drawn. It really made me want to be a Catholic even more because I was proud that. That they had such a towering intellect as a Catholic figure. Although some of the things that Thomas Aquinas says are a little bit sketchy here and there, you know what I mean? But if you take his metaphysics, it's pretty solid. Yeah. Now, well, there's divine simplicity that people, or, you know, they say, you know, the least to modal collapse and all this other business. And maybe it's hard to get your to wrap your head around that God is absolutely simple. So that's why I sort of developed this new digital Mignanian Thomism, which is sort of based on the holographic principle and black hole thermodynamics. So I tried to syncretize it with an emanationist type of Thomism. But you can still 
work off the old Thomism pretty well. I mean, and then you can just argue away from, you know, modal collapse and divine simplicity and all the other things that people have an issue with, seem to have an issue with, like uh, the difference between essence and existence, like contingent beings don't have um, existence essentially because um, they're dependent on S for their sustaining, to be sustained in, in existence, or S-A, I say S, you're supposed to say S-A, I guess. Okay. So I guess then that you're into Thomism because, you know, like, Thomas Aquinas is such a smart guy, I guess. That's, that's it. Yeah, well, once you look at, once you open up the books that he wrote and all the commentaries in the Bible that he wrote, it's, he's, he was like a mystic, pretty much, you know what I mean? He's more a theologian than a philosopher, and he was a mystic, too. So he had mystical experiences, and, and I was drawn to that, too, because I was studying the saints. You know, Padre Pio, who, he, would, he would bilocate, uh, and then there's the other one. Um, uh, he had the stigmata, St. Francis had the stigmata. You know, I was really interested in that kind of uh, a mystical experience. I had a couple of... Uh, experiences where, uh, you know, I was praying at a table with people and I broke down into tears uh, in the middle of nowhere and um, it was like I was beside myself for two hours and I didn't really understand what was happening, you know what I mean, kind of thing. I was sort of outside my body but I was, I was aware of my surroundings to a certain degree so I I don't know if that was a religious experience or not, but we were praying the rosary at a certain time, and it was like the joyful visitation, joyful mysteries, the visitation. Maybe there was a connection. I don't know. You have to know the mysteries of the rosaries to know what I mean by that. But, uh, yeah, it was it was pr pr pretty interesting. And then I was... Uh, like when I was far away from God, I had a, a little bit of an issue where we were tormented... Uh, by like sort of dark energy or dark spirits or we don't know what the hell it was at the time we thought it was like maybe some kind of infestation in our house so there was some kind of signs maybe that God was drawing me back I don't know could maybe I was going crazy at the time but uh, yeah I had a, a, a few religious experiences that sort of led me in this direction and then I got into Thomas Aquinas and then I guess the rest is history. So lately, I just you know read a lot of philosophy and I don't know throw okay. comments up okay. on social media. Well, can you introduce us to the digital Mignonian philo uh, Thomism? That sounds really interesting. Yeah, yeah, the digital Mignonian Thomism, like it, I call it, it digital. It's not really digital like uh, digital but, clock radio yeah, or yeah, anything yeah. like that. But it's digital in the sense that it's based on information entropy which is not the same type of uh, thermodynamic entropy like the second law of thermodynamics, but it's correlated. It's based on Shannon entropy, which is like the degrees of freedom in a message, like a bit or a surprise in a message. Like if you have a coin toss, it's one bit. The information could be heads or tails. Do you get what I'm saying? So that's a bit. It could be one or zero. That's what they mean by entropy. So we get that from... Entropy. There's a Bekenstein bound that the the physicists have figured out from information physics that it's like a any finite uh, volume has a um, it's the information of a finite volume of space is uh, correlated to its the boundary of its surface area. So basically, what they found out they studied from studying black hole thermodynamics is the black hole is not really a physical, it's a phys, it has physical characteristics, but it's not a physical, it's not a completely physical thing. They can describe it using just the information, and they found out, Leonard Susskind's found out, that the information is, is sort of accreted on the, uh, on the event horizon. It's sort of like they figured out, it's a Bekenstein band, they figured out how many bits it takes to fill a black hole, and there's a limit to the amount of information that you can fit in a finite area. So, which means that uh, space-time is not infinitely divisible. You reach a certain point, if you pump too much information into a certain point of space, it collapses into a black hole. So they figured out that space-time is probably emergent. That's where they got the holographic principle from. 
so they figured out that the space time is actually emergent from the degrees of freedom of uh, qubits subspace time. So it's like an error coded network in space time, which sort of gives you a little bit of warrant for the, the type of idealism that I'm talking about. So space time, so you can, what you can do is you can frame everything physical as phenomenologic. I'm not saying that the holographic principle is a, like I've been arguing with a few skeptics online, they say, you know, you're crazy, you know, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's not an immaterial, it's not an immaterial theory. I said, I realize that it's not immaterial, but I'm just giving a metaphysical bent on it. Do you know what I mean? Because a lot of the atheists, they could care less, and the physicists, they don't care about mes metaphysics. They think that's okay. a bunch of bull, right? Bro, so like, basically, let me slow it's, down it, a bit, yeah, because of, I, I guess the, the audience might not be able to catch up with the terms and stuff. Okay, so basically what okay, you're yeah, saying... Okay, yeah, I don't want to get too deep into it, yeah, because th there's all these crazy equations. I've got, I bought the books, and I'm reading quite a few right now, Susskind's Information yeah. uh, okay, so Universe and String Theory. Let's slow down a bit. And I, basically what you're saying is that uh, all, the, all of, of what we call physical can be just reduced into something that could be called a phenomenon. Right, that's why you, you right could be reduced, or uh, you could ca call it also like in a, a, an idealistic view of the universe. That, right, yeah. you say things have mass, but then you can just turn that into equations in vector space or parameter space, or they call it weight scale space when they're doing uh, artificial intelligence. You can you can put everything into math equations, and that's the transfer for uh, that's the the transform for for mass or that's the equation for volume or that's the equation for this that's where I, the Mignonian the Mignonian part comes into my digital Mignonian Thomism because Mignon had the theory of things have so signed they have a nature of so such a being or so being or and they have being but not every nature has being, and some beings are impossible beings because they have contradictory mm -hmm. natures. But they're still beings in a sense that you can think about them, so they have That's mind existence. Right? Like, Do you know what I mean? I, I don't understand the concept of something that is impossible to be, but is also Well, it, it can exist because it can exist in the holographic universe because what they found is that it's everything is coded on a lower boundary but i guess it's not existing in the same way as it's thought to exist well i guess it's more like a neoplatonic form yeah, thing yeah. but they're not forms like a dog a form of a dog like a picture of a dog that's 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 what people get in their mind it's more a mathematical form mm -hmm. it's a math form like a teg, if you check Tegmark's math universe, everything is a math structure, mm -hmm. and it just emerges in it, and it, and it's, it's sort of in our mind we realize the phenomenologic uh, way things ex are experienced to us, that are given to us as objects, but really in reality, things are coded on a lower boundary, and they don't have the dictionary for exactly how that is working. I think there's, I guess a, you're there's diving another guy a named. Bit into the presuppositions of some of the views on the philosophy of mind, though, right? Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. I think that's why the, the quantum. There's lots of different types of entanglement. Like what they've said is the space time, subspace time is entangled. It's not really when you say entangled, it's not a bunch of strings that you can see that this is a string to that, yeah, attached yeah. to that. It's not a physical thing. It's just a relation between bits of entropy and, and the possibilities of, of confirmations of what they can be in. And so there's like a thing called quantum teleportation where they can, sit, they can take advantage of entanglement and send information back and forth. Actually, scientists are doing that now. I mean, they can't do faster than light entanglement in a physical sense, but... What I'm talking about is subspace time. The 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 fabric of space time is is a is a quantum error code. They've figured they've seen that there's error coding in space. So what was I was reading this thing by Suskin and he said um, that they've figured out a way 
let's say okay so let's say you're in a room right and in reality the room is not an empty space it's got particles there's particles coming in and out of existence there's virtual virtual particles popping in maybe they're not particles but it's like excitations in the fields the quantum fields mm -hmm. do you know what i mean like at the sub sub level where we can't see but in all that noise in that room you can talk to your mother across the room right so they've figured that the way that the sound waves are traveling through all that noise is through the structure of sub of subspace time do you know what i mean through that fabric of entanglement because they've figured out how to how to how to shoot a message through that kind of noise and then it comes out on the other side and they figured out that there must be some kind of a, a structure to space time that the that the signals are are following. Do you get what I'm saying? I'm 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 really giving you a rudimentary um, explanation of of how that is happening. But what they're saying is subspace time is an entangled network and it's error coded. So it's already built in for communication, which is another thing that points to probably. There's a mind that's preserving the truth functions of all the incompossible, ontologically possible worlds. Because you can have epistemically possible worlds in a math sense. But the math won't work out. In, in, you know, in string theory, they have like 10 to the 500 possible worlds or something crazy like that. And some are the like swampland worlds that can't really be real because, you know, if you have the cosmological constant at a certain thing, then space won't Co coalesce or whatever, or it'll um, inflate too fast. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But there are worlds that you can have. Other worlds that are that have like different uh, different constants, different maybe you would come up to different laws of nature, and they they're ontologically possible. So there would have to be a mind because each world that you have is coded on a lower boundary, and it would be you'd need a dictionary to make that world come into being. So that's where you know, it would be grounded into a mind from if you if you took modal actualism as a presupposition, meaning all potencies are grounded in something, not nothing, right? So even if mm -hmm. you have virtual particles or or you say the quantum field is God, well it can't be the quantum field is God because that has to be grounded in something purely actual. That's why we have this digital Miami and Thomism, which is like a mind. It's an immaterial mind, but it's a lower dimensional mind. So it's not, when you say immaterial, people think, well, that doesn't make sense. It has to be made out of something. Yeah. Well, it's made out of information, right? Like, so God is basically like the Cantor absolute infinite information. So God is like dipolar kind of thing. His will is his power of creation. And his, his, he has his intellect that he's self-apprehending. And that self-apprehension is causing creative act so it's like the creative act is a eternal thing in in a neoplatonic sense so it's not like god's walking along one day then he decides to create that really doesn't make any sense right that's why you're getting a lot of flack on god is simple but then he decides to create kind of thing so there's an accident in god but really i mean there's no accident in god because he's the final first and final cause so everything's ordered to god Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So basically, when you say that it's digital, is that it's just uh, equations and information, which everything can be reduced to this idealistic phenomena, right? And yeah, then, everything can be reduced to that kind of phenomena because it's just it's information coding, and that's and then you get qualia from maybe patterns in the code. If you, let's say if you if you visualize the code, it would be like a coded pattern network. And then the the it would say church code. If you're in, if you understand if you ever come across lambda calculus, say the whole thing is like a church code, and mm -hmm. that's where your substances lie in the maybe tessellated in the Hilbert space. Okay. Everything is entangled. That's where your maybe your Aristotelian substances would be, and your essences. Like that's where I get back to my Jungianism, where you can have a, a square, you know, the famous square circle, because you can have your equation for circularity, 
for circle for for area of a circle you can have your so that 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 translates to a property right the property a circularity of a property so you can have that property you can have a property of square so you can have that for the area of a square but those two I mean, they can't contract essay. They can't contract the essay natural because they're a contradictory, but they can exist as sort of like maybe code that, that aren't compatible with each other in that sense. You know what I mean? So you like can have your like non existent object. Error, I guess. Right, as an error object, right. Maybe something like that. That's a good way to think about it, sure. So you can have that error object because what. On my thing in digital Manyangi and Thomism, you have essences. You have a phenomenologic essence, which is like the Bekenstein bound, because they say on a Bekenstein bound of a human brain, I wrote it down here, it's like, I don't know, 10 to the 27 bits of information. Don't quote me on that, that but that would be your human brain. So you can pixelate the human brain right down to the quantum level, you get the back, Bekenstein bound and then you can voxelate that human brain. So e even whatever is on the inside of the brain, so the whole structure of the brain you can pixelate it and then you can have it on a 2D surface and then all that information can translate to a 3D surface. Do you get what I'm saying? So that would be your essence. But in digital Mainyangi and Thomism, your essence, you would have a tripartite instead of a instead of a hylomorphic. You'd have hylomorphic idealism. So your morph would be your information, and your hyl would be your modes of essay or your the modes of creative act. So God would be like a phenomenologic cause, a virtual cause. So you from your four causes. Let me see. I wrote it down here somewhere. Yeah, from. Are you in? Are you familiar with Aristotelian hylomorphic dualism, which is what standard yeah, yeah. Thomism runs off yeah. of? Like the four causes: you have your efficient cause, your formal cause, final cause, material cause. Yeah. You know those, right? Okay. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. So God cannot be a material cause, right? Because then he'd be in potency to something else, and then yeah. there'd be a, like an infinite regress of gods, right? So God is just a final cause, a formal cause, and an efficient cause. That's where you get your your first or your four your five ways of Aquinas. Anyways, on digital Mainyangi and Thomism, you have prime matter which exists through substantial change, it would be your universal wave function from uh, the Everett many worlds. You know how, I mean, some physicists say that the universal wave function doesn't exist, but it'd be a huge complex, complex number, right, of all the wave states or wave functions together. Yeah. The universal, yeah. it would describe all of matter. So that would be your prime matter. That would take the substances, the code for the substances, you get what I'm saying? That would mm -hmm. persist through substantial change. Mm -hmm. So f on my idealism, you don't have any matter. It's just like a lucid, It's like a hologram. Robust, yeah, it's a robust, abstract experience. So it's just a mind to mind. It's God's mind to many minds. So you'd have quantum many minds. That's, a, that's actually an interpretation that some philosophers take to mind. So the mind would be entangled with the body, the body would be emergent, but the experiences would be happening in a different dimension, right? The modal theater would be, it, it, the experience would be happening in 3D, but it's not really happening in 3D. But we would just get the feeling that it is. So the creative act of God is entangled subspace time with our mind, our mind is like a math structure because it takes the structure of space-time with it. And that's how you get your memories from the block universe, right? Because in the block universe, you're like a worm. You have temporal parts. You still have your parts from when you were a kid because they all follow you right down. That's where you get your memories from. You yeah, access yeah. them through entanglement. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So really, your your thoughts are... In, they're not in your mind, but they follow you. That's how you can you can you, you can access things through entanglement. Do you know what I mean? But it's it's a different type of entanglement. It's a subspace-time information entanglement. It's not the entanglement 
where they say your quantum we can't have a quantum mind because the brain is too uh, warm and wet so you get decoherence right away you know that's why they said uh, Roger Penrose's um, microtubules and the qubits collect in the microtubules and that's how they say you can have a quantum mechanism for consciousness it is possible maybe they've got they've got a few they've got holonomic consciousness they've got another one uh, but yeah, I guess you, we're, we're read... covering a lot of stuff here, man. And I, Am I, wanna... I getting overboard a little bit? No, yeah. I, I guess. But I, I want to, you know, like let the audience follow where we are now. Okay, so. Okay, so I was, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I sort of get uh, go on tangents here. So I, what I was saying was, okay, I, I, do you get what I'm saying with the yeah, yeah. digital Manyangian Tominism? That it's like a it's like a tripartite thing in the modes of essay so it would be let me get the thing here it would be God's substance is God's act of self apprehension so you get that right so God is just a mind understanding himself and from his understanding he he affects all the information in the universe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a, a contingent being is like a soul and mind that's animated by modes, emanating modes of God's will and intellect. This is a metaphysical explanation. It's not a physical explanation, so that's probably why it wouldn't make sense to skeptics, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like they're mm -hmm. saying, I can't see modes of S. What is this? It's like a hidden variable. It doesn't make sense. But it's a metaphysical thing. It's it's what's processing the code, right, and giving you the phenomenal experience. It's pure act, or okay. the Thomistic well, pure act. Well, well, now that you mentioned skeptics, right? Like, for example, for some someone like let's say Matt Dillahunty, whether he would just say that he just doesn't know because you haven't proven it in in a testable. And well, no, they've done the math for the uh, holographic universe and. It's it's getting pretty solid. You can go on uh, YouTube and watch the uh, lectures like of uh, Leonard Susskind and Busso and uh, Tahuft actually won. He got the he got the uh, what do they call that? The Nobel Prize. He was one of the guys who sort of invented the holographic principle. He got Nobel Prize. So these guys aren't dumb, right? So they're I think they're on the cutting edge of something seriously that's going to turn over physics. Because it's not quantum mechanics. It's the next wave. It's like it's information physics. So like what I said, they're figuring out okay, what it comes from the black hole information paradox. They say when things get accreted into a black hole, what happens, right? When the black yeah. hole throws off Hawking radiation and evaporates what happens to the information because there's a law that bits can't be destroyed yeah that's a new law of physics if you I gave you that um, thing if you watched Leonard Susk in the holographic universe he has a good lecture there and it's uh, for people like us who don't have graduate degrees or PhDs in this kind of thing but even a lot of PhDs physics people don't know it's because He says when all the bits fall into the, uh, when things get accreted into a black hole, their information stays in there, even though they're thermalized, right? The, the coarse grained information gets thrown back into the universe. So you've got black hole complementarity going on there. But there's information behind, in the event horizon that can't be lost. Like Hawking said, it could be lost. But uh, to Hooft and Susskind said it can't be lost because the universe would heat up, we'd all get burnt up, laws of thermodynamics would get thrown out of whack. So they said, because for microreversibility we have to be able to get all the inf quantum information back. So it's accreted there, the information. Okay. So basically so are you saying the, that um, black holes prove that God exists or something I guess you know if you look at it from the uh, I'm not I'm not saying I'm not saying that you can get a direct implication yeah. material implication yeah, know, there but what I'm saying what I'm saying is they found found from that 
that the universe is more information processing than anything else. Mm -hmm. Like uh, like Archibald Wheeler said, it, his his axiom was it from bit, right? Don't think about matter as things are material, but don't think about other as consciousness or material. Think about things as information. You know what I mean? And if you if things are information, there's a dictionary, and like from Ross's. Uh, immateriality immateriality of the intellect argument you need a you need a mind to uh, to preserve truth functions that's also like the the Kripke Wittgenstein thing with Quine they had the quest plus uh, you guys the the philosophy people probably be in, know that that one that mm -hmm. you you need semantic determinacy and you only get that from a mind you need, you need to know what somebody's talking about right Okay, so uh, let me back this up again, okay? So yeah. basically, black holes means that the universe is made up of information, or is information. information basically, means, yeah, yeah, they're extending what's happening at black holes to the entire universe. Okay. because and then information inf inf needs a dictionary, dictionary needs a mind to preserve truth. Exactly, right, to preserve the truth functions, uh, otherwise it's just a mess. Wow. The code won't... Un unless you think the code is just going to, the, the the code is going to go by by chance, by blind chance, right? But why can't it be like from blind, uh, you know, like an accident? Well, because the information can't process itself, right? Okay. You know what I'm saying? So does it mean that it? it you need it, something that's like, pure it, act. Like I said, the universal like wave function is different. You mean like something that intended it to be or designed? That's what you're saying. So, yeah. Well. There's intentionality in like a meaning, or there's an intent. Like I have an intent to do something, but yeah, intentionality. Things have a meaning. They have an aboutness. You're right. So that's what we see mathematically, and looking at the metaphysics of the universe. Like yeah, I would say that you would definitely need a mind. If you're looking at the holographic universe in a metaphysical way. Or you can just wipe it under the table and say it doesn't make sense, it's stupid, I don't want to listen to string theory, I don't want to listen to information physics. Uh, black holes don't exist, of course you're going to get people like that. But you really have to, you know, wake up and, and read what these physicists are saying. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm not saying it's, it's a immaterial theory. Like uh, the next, the, the lower dimensional is an immaterial. It does have physical properties, but it's more mathematical than anything else, and it's not physical. So you can't equivocate on your use of the term physical. It's not 3D physical. Do you know what I'm saying? It's subspace time, and it's more dimensionless. Because one, in string theory, then they get into P brains, which are dimensionless, and then they have one dimension, two dimensional, three dimensional, right? So it's more mathematic dimensions. And I'm a moderate math realist. I'm saying these things do exist to a certain extent, but then there's some constructs that do exist only in minds. Hmm. I know the other Thomas don't, don't ascribe to this, but they probably think it's a bunch of sophistry. I, it doesn't bother me really, I don't care, because it does make more sense. I, I know there's another channel, uh, the uh, philosophy guy or something, he has, uh, do you know what's his, what his name is? He has the digital physics argument for the existence of God. It, it escapes me now, the name. Inspiring philosophy, I think. Yeah, yeah he, I, I, don't, I don't ascribe to his, his, uh, his version, but it's pretty close to what... Yeah. I watch him a it lot. It is information processing. Yeah, that's good. That he's he's not a stupid person, so he's he's doing a good job there. Okay. So you you if you if you look at it, your worldview is that you believe in an idealist universe, right? I yeah. Well, it's not it's not Berkeley's idealism. It's 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 a different. It's a reductive, hylomorphic, uh, metaphysical idealism that 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 we're just we're just minds and we're we're um, we're entangled with the uh, the creative act of God God is simple God is dipolar so he's simple in his in being in his self-understanding so this would be consciousness 
I mean, creation would be like a subconscious level of God. It's like uh, you'd have to read Pseudo Dionysius, the, okay, the Arapagate. Can I ask you, uh, I, this might be mm. a little off topic, but what about that's dreams, okay. though, right? Like dreams are also phenomenal. Yeah, that's where you get into hot water, right? Sure. Well, dreams, then you'd get into accessible relations. Dreams wouldn't be accessible to other people, right? Yeah. So then you would know that you, you weren't dreaming and something like that. You're not in a dream because you're accessible to others, right? So there'd be layers of reality there. So what would you say that it that dreams are as real as as how we are real right now? Because if there is no no difference in the ontology, right, then there's no also not no dif no difference at all in it. Well, there is a difference in the ontology. There would be different modes of essay involved in a dream. Like and a, a dream would just have essay intellectus or something essay abstract intellect. But a real experience would have essay naturel, essay phenomenologic. You know what I mean? It's all about what type of modes are accreted, and the informational content. But it would be the, less that, less that complicated. That comes into the question of who accretes or these. Uh, as it's essay, just based on your essence. It's based on your essence because essence is also a mode. Do you know what I mean? So the mode, the essay is accreted according to the informational content of the essence. So if you, I don't know, you'd have to read a book about existential Thomism because essence can't precede existence. Everything reduces to existence. God is tant tantum s or ipsum essay existence, existence in himself. But to avoid pantheism, God is not the material cause he's just a formal cause do you know what i mean he's not he's not us so that's sort of like contradicting, it's not spinoza's right? it's well, not spinoza's it's god sort of god is like when you say yeah, that god isn't the material essay then that then that's something that god isn't right so it's something that we're de dependent on ourselves as material essay so, no, we don't have any matter. We're just minds, basically, and information with the soul. But the soul is more, it would be more, it would be like, an, it would be the most concrete, it would be the most concrete participation with God. That would be the only way that I could explain it. The soul, the soul would be the closest, would have the most, the most, uh, the most, create the most modes of essay. So it would be essay animus. So only, only souls would have essay animus, like vegetative souls but or, or rational souls. God, right? Like when you say yeah. that you're avoiding pantheism, to say that there are, there is a, a mode that isn't depend or doesn't, that isn't God. Oh. Or is it dependent on God? What do you mean by that? There's a mode that isn't dependent on God. Maybe how did I frame that? Yeah, well, well you were talking about the that that the essence, right? That our material essence is not dependent on God because God is not material. Is what you said. It's what you said. Oh, right. Well, yeah, God can't be matter. Yeah, but in my view, that's, well, that's how they, you get into a problem of creation ex nihilo. How do you create matter from something that's pure act? How do you get potency out of that? That's another problem that classical theism will run into. Do you know what I mean? Or even theism in general. I think that's why the digital one makes more sense. You just jettison matter altogether. That's how God creates ex nihilo. God doesn't create it like there isn't a creative act involved really the creative act is a is a is an eternal act of God's mind that's really problematic though right like wh when you say when you define it as there is a creator and there's a creation you're st even if you assign it as like a as being digital or just information or eternal, then there is no by the no de creation by definition if it's eternal. 
There is no equation. Yeah, it's just no, there's no creation. Just a, a can- there's no creation if it's all it's if it's already eternal. Yeah, it's just it's God is it's God's realize his active potencies in creation. Mean? His active potencies, he's created every world in a mathematical. He's he laid down every world that possibly could created. He's created other worlds. Do you know what I mean? Many worlds. And we're entangled with this world. That's why to our world, so that I'm talking modal realism. Do you know what I mean? Our world is real from our perspective, but it's not the only actual world. There are other worlds that are also exist at the same time. Like from quantum, from, from, from the Everett many worlds, that's why we have counterpart, like P-zombie counterparts who are exactly us, but we're not entangled with that person. We're not entangled with that emergent body, but it's a math body. It doesn't have essay. It doesn't have essay naturel. If you study uh, the Everett many worlds, you get what I'm talking about. But that's not a different universe. I'm talking about that's just different branches in our universe. Because they get around there, because there's a problem in quantum physics called the Wigner's friend. So they get around that. Then there's also the okay, the, so the coin I, flipping I'm, paradox. I'm, yeah, but okay. Um, I'm seeing the Renner paradox. I'm seeing like two layers here, right? So there's a yeah. layer that is God, and He's eternal, right? And He's created mm-hmm. every possible world that He could out of His potency. But right, also right. It's all us. active potencies in God, yeah. and they're infinite. But right. there's also us who is created but more of like mathematically and so you could sort of that's your yeah and we're realized in time right we're entangled we're entangled with our it's like the memory stick analogy we're entangled with that and we we experience every branch that could possibly happen in our life is is already realized souls but we're eternal souls but just entangled in this reality modal reality that we have we're entangled, yeah, with our certain, and then we we help we help create our what we decide in our branching world. So it's like, I don't know if you know Alexander Pruss, he has a paper called "Traveling Forms." Okay, Quantum but don't Traveling you find Forms. that problematic though when you say that we are eternal souls that that are just happen to be entangled? Well, because we exist in God's mind, and God is. Well, we're not in God's mind, but there's the exemplars. There's God's, the, the, we exist exemplars in God's mind. But, you know, there's the divine ideas, and God is always self-apprehending. So there couldn't be a time when God didn't know us. Do you know what I mean? Because God is eternal. So it can't be, it can't be that God just decided one time to create. It has to be an eternal creation because God is always self-knowing, because God is eternal. And like Aquinas is saying here, here, I'll read, like okay, I've mentioned do. that on my it's other... It's really interesting, I, like, okay. I, I mentioned it in my other video there, like, from the Summa. He says, I answer that it must be said that the act of God's intellect is his substance, for if his act of understanding were other than his substance, then something else, as the philosopher says, would be the act and perfection of the divine substance to which the divine substance would be related as potentiality is to act, which is altogether impossible because the act of understanding is the perfection and act of the one understanding. So God's understanding himself. To understand is not an act passing to anything extrinsic for it remains in the operator as his own act and perfection as existence is the perfection of the one existing. Just as existence follows form, so in like manner to understand follows the intelligible species. Now in God, there is no form other than God. You know what I mean? There's nothing that God can understand that's outside God. That's why you get these skeptics who are saying, why, what motivates God to be good? Well, nothing can, God doesn't have any moral obligations. God's not a moral actor. God's just a moral ground. That's where you get this from, which is other than his existence. Hence, his essence itself is also his intelligible species. It necessarily follows that his act of understanding must be his essence. So that's why I say 
That's why um, existential Thomism says God's essence is to exist. It's its existence. So it's a dipolar. God is a will. His will is to exist, and his intellect is the information or his understanding or his divine, the divine mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess operations. The, um, they're also referring they're also to referring absolute to divine God. simplicity with this then, right? It's sort of implied. Uh, in his self-knowing of, him, of himself, God is simple, right? We don't, we're, we're not, we don't have any access to that. We never will have any access to the divine knowing, mm -hmm. right? So he's... He's simple in that sense. So it's like a, it's a pseudo Dionysian take. Thomas okay. Aquinas was uh, also influenced by pseudo Dionysus. So it's an emanation kind of thing. So there's different levels of the of the super essential divine darkness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let me give a brief uh, understanding of the uh, your your concept of God before we move on, right? So. You said that God is simple to himself, right? He and he he knows nothing other than God, right? He, himself. And also with that he created us but in a in the material way, but we're already there eternally as these mathematical yeah information like mathematical equations bound to be created in the, in a in a temporal uh and then be to in, be realized in yeah, a temporal yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah okay so i i can actually see that as an escape from the pantheism thing because yeah but, but the still, only hard part yeah the hard part is about the the how do you grasp what a soul actually is, you know what I mean? That's the difficult part because it would be a composite of information, which would be the mind in subspace time, Hilbert space, and then the soul would be sort of a mode of essay and animated information packet kind of thing. Which so God, the information in God's creative act would be entangled with the mind. So there would be a causation. So if we think to go out and touch something, then God God's creative act would be affecting change in the modal theater. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it would be like a virtual reality where he would be, but it's a robust, abstract, lucid experience. It's not a virtual reality, but it would be like a phenomenological virtual causation that God would be causing things to happen based on his entanglement with my mind. But we're not entangled with God's mind. We're entangled with the creative act. We can't be entangled because it's it's incomprehensible and it's too complicated. Well, let's go into a bit into the teleology of this b b before we move on. So, you you this in this worldview of yours, there is a like yes a multiverse, like an infinite. Right. Possible. There would be a multiverse, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, there would be a multiverse, right? So, how do you? solve the problems that that creates for i guess for a christian theology right so like if i'm going to if this is the narrative I, in my life that i'm accepting jesus and stuff um how do you explain okay then in, in other realities i'm going to hell anyways but maybe in this you know i'm well going you to are going not. yeah well i mean they've had saints who have been shown, you know, um, visions of them in hell. This is how you would suffer in hell if you don't repent. And so the God's shown them, that would be their counterpart, suffering in hell. So he'd be able to animate the abstract uh, P-zombie counterpart that you already have after that counterpart have made all the bad choices. So in a sense, your, your, your counterpart is in hell. But it's not you with the proper modes of essay accreted to it. But it would be a possible world that God can reveal to you. Do you okay, know what I mean? Another question, though. So I, I basically assumed it at first, but I. But how does hell and heaven fit into your worldview with all these, um, you know, all these stuff? How how does that fit? Is is it simply that? That hell is God's judgment uh, or wrath, or is it the absence of God? What is your concept of that? 
Well, it would never be absence of God because, like, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the res ratio terminology distinction. Every being that has being has something good about it insofar that it is existing because being and goodness are sort of convertible transcendentals. God is the, the goodness to which all beings are ordered because he's the final cause or the reason that we exist, right? So even the devil is good because he has being. There's a purpose to the devil's existence, even though it might be inscrutable to us, right? Maybe it's for for a significant um, to so that we would get virtues out of it or something like that, or to overcome patience. You get into virtue ethics. Pa if we have patience in uh, in experiencing troubles and tribulations, we get more communion, more community. People come together, things like that, right? So there would be a way that God couldn't make the world as good as he could if there weren't evil in it because there wouldn't be things like courageous people there wouldn't be things like people suffering from diseases but then we would learn more about nature because you know like I learned pharmacology and the study of medicine so um, I understand that that perspective of why that type of evil would be allowed in the world like viruses and things so that we can learn about natural theology about nature more than if that evil hadn't existed. So we would get more more virtue out of it. But you know I would what I find mean? that a very weak argument for the problem of evil though, right? Like it's That would be more like the logical problem of evil, wouldn't it? Like uh, God permits all these things to happen. I mean, okay, so you, you you're trying to ask me why do we have animal suffering and things like that? Well, I mean, you couldn't have um, material beings without, like, uh, en entropy transfer. Like, I'm talking about thermal entropy now. You need Gibbs free energy freed up to make, uh, you know, you have to eat meat so you, get, so you can make ATP and the Krebs cycle. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, you can't have material beings without suffering unless you can, you can affect miracles all the time. It's kind of like you can't have this without the other. So it's probably it's an impossible task well, for God to have material if, beings. Is there anything impossible for God though? Like if you look yeah, at there, the Yeah, there 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 would be there would be logical impossibilities like, you know what I mean? God can't be pure potency and pure act and things like that. Like there's logical possibilities that God cannot actually be that or do that. It would come into an in complete contradiction, and that would be one of them. Is I know atheists say that uh, you know why would God pick a way of evolution that animals are eating animals, and there would be from neg entropy, Brillian's neg entropy and entropy exchange and Gibbs free energy. There's no way to have material beings to run the the complicated metabolic pathways, and uh, without killing animals and you know digesting blood and getting iron things like that but i guess what you're doing though is you're making a circular argument right like you're saying that this universe can't be th this way uh, can be any other way because it has to be this way right so i don't think that's a real circular argument well i guess like for example when you def when we say that god is omnipotent right like and you're also saying that even a square circle. Well, we don't mean omnipotent that God can do everything. I think there's a there's a clever manipulation of the word in omnipotent. God can only, God when we say God's omnipotent, he's the ground of the potencies that are able to be actualized. Do you know what I mean? He can't do everything like I mean God can't ride a bike. I mean, I guess maybe he could become um, Jesus or something and Jesus could go ride a bike or something through the hypostatic union and things like that right but there's all these kind of things that due to God's nature God's limited in, in some of the things but it's not a limitation really because to be a human being is to be a contingent being and to be limited so to be a, a human being is not to be pure act so it's really not something becoming of something that's omnipotent. Do you know what I mean? So it's a logical contradiction. So they say God can't 
brush his teeth so he's not omnipotent, but really having to be able to brush your teeth is not uh, something that an omnipotent being would have as a property. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so I guess when So it's we, kind of a silly we, argument, really. But the thing about logic, right, is that it it's gr gra logic is basically grounded on God. What logic is is defined by God Himself. And well, yeah, I don't know if logic is. Like, there's a lot of different systems logical. So once you start studying logic, it's all based on what axioms you accept into your system. So, I mean, I know there's non-contradiction and things like that, right? But I mean, I suppose you can't. There's there's certain ways that you can't break non-contradiction, but then there's other ways that the law of non-contradiction could be broken, I suppose. You know what I mean? I haven't looked too deep into it. I didn't make any notes on it, but I know there's examples. Like, quantum physics doesn't break non-contradiction, but there are rules that can be... I think distribution rule is broken by quantum mechanics or something like that. So there's... There are certain aspects of logic that that are not sort of like, um, I'm not an expert on it, but uh, it's not it's not set in stone. Do you know what I mean? Okay, but you, got we, you, you mentioned logic. that logic is based, simply based on actions. But what I'm saying is that God determines what the actions are. Um, yeah, I suppose I suppose to a certain extent, right, because he's he's he would be the ground of being right? yeah and he could bypass all of that because he he is the ultimate creator you know he's he's the he's the only well i mean one. i don't think god could be existence and non-existence god couldn't be privated of existence like that would be like a contravening the contra the, the identity reflexivity right he can't be pure act and then be non-existent that's why that would be kind of a stupid argument to lay against, level against. Well, I don't think it's you would call it a stupid argument, though, if if it's actually, I guess, like, you know, if we define God as... You're saying God should be able to right? die, right? Is that what you're saying, that God can't die, so God's not God? Maybe, but, you know, I guess, like, when we claim the definition that God is the ultimate being that can do all things, you know, then... What, well, that's what, not the definition, though, that, that, that classical theists are running on. We're saying God's omnipotent. He's the ground of all potencies, of all logical things, according to things nature. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Right? So you can't take a, a horse and, and a horse can't be a monkey, right? Kind of thing, kind of thing. It's just based on their nature. Or a horse can't fly fly like a rocket or something like so God can't die because God's pure act. Okay. But I guess He's the ground of be, being. He be... sustains everything in being. So if God died there wouldn't be any being and it would just be a, a it would be nothingness. But 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 by definition, right? Um, God has limits by the classical theist definition. Yeah, I, su I suppose I wouldn't frame it like that, that God has limits. I would say the limits that God has are just things that are that are sort of uh, not becoming of, uh, of a being that's pure actuality. They're, they're repugnant. They're repu I think John Dunn Scottis would say they're repugnant to the, to the understanding of what God is. Okay, but so you, what you said, just said was that the limits that God has are repugnant to his actuality, I guess. Right, well, so like the limits that God has, you could turn that back on saying uh, then God can't just exist in the understanding. That's where the ontological argument comes into. You should get Daniel Vecchio on your show because he's uh, brilliant at the ontological argument. So I guess you could bring that in and say then God has no limits. God can't exist in the understanding alone. God exists in the understanding. At least we have a little bit of an understanding of what God would be. God must exist extensionally. Out of all the definitions that exist, existence in reality must be one. 
but really the on on digital Mayanian Thomism reality can't exist because all of the dictionary for the holographic universe has to be grounded in a mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, bro, it's been awesome talking to you. We're over an hour now. And, um, oh, okay. So you're good. Maybe, you, yeah, you can have me on another time and then I can yeah. bore you to death with all the craziness. Yeah, right? but you know, it's been really, a really good time for me, man. Like, um, I really appreciate it. Yeah. I thank you so much. And if you, uh, if you want to like make a closing statement, you know, like summarize it to the audience, that would be great. Um, you know what? Actually, I don't have a closing statement. I realize I rambled on. Hopefully people understand what I'm getting at and it's not too esoteric. And I think people should take it as it's a metaphysical, it's a metaphysical thing. And I think it's, um, it's a counter to existential inertia. You can't really have existential inertia. It doesn't make sense, especially in the holographic universe with your quantum fields. Everything is, all contingent beings are dependent on quantum fields and, and some kind of a, uh, computator or a computating or, or information processing mind yeah so okay awesome man and it's been great talking to you and um i appreciate it i hope we can do this again thank you yeah maybe sometime in the future we'll see or you can get some some really smart some other uh guests who are someone. way smarter <laughs> okay Awesome. Well, uh, thank you, bro. Uh... So that's the end of it. Thanks for tuning in, guys. This is your host, Elmo Ador Jr. And thank you for listening in. And please subscribe. Please follow us on Facebook. Please, please follow this. Please. Thanks. <laughs>